spend our everyday lives surrounded by oxygen and we tend to take it for granted. It's just part of the air we breathe with no color, no smell, and no taste. Invisible. And yet, the fire of life burning within our bodies requires a constant supply of fresh oxygen. If we were to stop eating, we could live for about a month. We could only live for about a week without a drink of water. But without a breath of oxygen, we would die in six minutes. In fact, out of all the elements we need to live, it is the most vital. Single oxygen atoms combine in twos to form molecules of pure oxygen O2. In this form, oxygen comprises about one-fifth of the atmosphere. O2 is very active chemically and will combine with nearly all other elements. When combined with carbon, as in the burning of carbon with oxygen, carbon dioxide gas and energy are produced. The rapid burning energy of a flaming matchstick and the slow burning within us, the energy of life. The flame will live only as long as it continues to receive adequate supplies of carbon, which it receives from the matchstick, and oxygen, which it gets from the air. The carbon dioxide gas is of no use to the flame and is expelled as a waste product of the combustion. The same process applies to all animal life. Animals receive carbon from sugar molecules that are derived from the food they eat. The oxygen is drawn into the cells of the body and carbon dioxide is expelled as waste. This process is called respiration, the mechanical act of transporting gases to and from the site of respiration is called breathing. All around us, animals thrive. By looking at the respiratory systems of other animals, we can better understand the problems that they, like us, must solve in drawing upon the available oxygen. Dissolved oxygen permeates the oceans and fresh waters so that here too, animals thrive. The paramecium is a protist, a free-living single cell, and its respiratory process is as simple as they come. It doesn't need to exert any effort when drawing in oxygen. Its cell membrane is no barrier to the oxygen molecules in the water around it, so O2 simply passes through. The O2 is used up in the cell, so there's never quite as much inside the cell as there is outside. O2 constantly moves into the cell to balance the oxygen content on both sides of the membrane. This movement of O2 from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is called simple diffusion. The newly formed carbon dioxide waste, which concentrates inside the cell, diffuses outwards in the same way. If the paramecium enters an area which has no food or in which the oxygen is low, it will move elsewhere. The individual cells that make up the body of a fish aren't so lucky. There are a million million of them, all packed around each other, enclosing each other. Food and oxygen must be shipped to them, and wastes taken away. This is done along the highways of the circulatory system. The transporting vehicle is the blood, all of which passes through the gills. The blood is closest to the surface at the gills, rushing through a profusion of capillaries, and it's here that the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs across a respiratory membrane, which is only a couple of cells thick. In the gills, this respiratory membrane is arrayed into the water as row upon row of delicate feathery tissue. This ensures that there is enough surface area through which the vital diffusion can take place. The fish itself plays a vital role in its own respiration. It breathes, gulping in water and opening its gill covers, forcing a current of water through the gills. Take a fish out of water and it will die from lack of oxygen. And yet, air has 40 times more oxygen in it than water. So why can't this fish breathe in this oxygen-rich environment? One reason is suffocation. 
Without the support of water, the delicate gill tissues have collapsed against each other, drastically reducing their usable surface area. The second reason has to do with drying out. Molecules of oxygen and carbon dioxide must be dissolved in water to diffuse across the respiratory membrane. The membrane must be kept moist. When it is dried out, the oxygen and carbon dioxide cannot pass. The fish will die if it isn't returned to the water in time. Keeping the respiratory membrane from drying out is more of a problem for land animals. Like us, the earthworm has a respiratory surface that draws from the oxygen-rich air. In this case, the air that exists between soil particles. The earthworm must keep its skin moist because its entire surface functions as a respiratory membrane. It can do this by living in the moist soil. If we were to wear our respiratory membrane on the outside of our body, it would quickly dry out. This problem is avoided simply by moving the respiratory membrane to the body's interior, where it can be kept moist. Amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals use lungs, which are enclosed within the chest cavity. In humans, these lungs are just beneath the ribs and right on top of the diaphragm, which is a sheet of muscle bisecting the body cavity. A passageway connects the lungs to the outside world, exiting at the nose and mouth. Lungs are elastic. They can be expanded and contracted. When we inhale, muscles across the ribs, and especially the muscles of the diaphragm, pull in unison to enlarge the chest cavity, which in turn expands the lungs. This creates a partial vacuum in the lungs, and outside air rushes in to equalize the pressure. When we exhale, the rib and diaphragm muscles relax, returning the chest cavity and the lungs to their resting position. This motion squeezes the air back out again. To understand the details of the human respiratory system, we can follow the path of a single oxygen molecule, represented by this white dot. As the chest cavity and the lungs expand, we are pulled towards a nostril, the gateway to the nasal cavity. Just inside, we pass through a protective screen of coarse hairs, which prevent most of the larger particles of airborne debris from entering. Once beyond these hairs, we enter a large chamber called the nasal cavity, where the air must whirl past a series of three projecting shelves. In here, we notice a sudden rise in temperature. All the surfaces in this chamber are lined with a mucous membrane, which is filled with capillaries, which radiate the blood's heat into the air. We will continue to find this mucous membrane until the very end of our journey. It secretes a sticky sheet of mucus that serves to trap particles and moisten the air. The mucus is slowly moved along on a carpet of hair-like cilia that beat in a wave-like motion towards the throat, where the particle-laden mucus is swallowed. Here, in this microscopic cross-section, we can see the cilia in motion. Leaving the nasal cavity behind, we enter the pharynx. We pass by a large opening that leads to the mouth. We could easily have taken a shortcut, entering through the mouth instead of the nostrils, but we would have bypassed the important warming, moisturizing and filtering that takes place in the nasal cavity. The lower portion of the pharynx serves a dual purpose. Both food and air pass through here. Up ahead, the passage divides. Food goes this way, down the esophagus, while air goes this way, down the larynx. When air takes the wrong fork and goes down the esophagus, the stomach will simply send it back up with a burp. But if food or drink go pouring down the larynx to the lungs, it can lead to serious trouble. This possibility is reduced by the epiglottis, which is a part of the larynx which extends up into the pharynx. This flap of cartilage functions like a trap door. When we swallow, the epiglottis closes off the top of the larynx. When the food is passed, it opens up again. This action of the larynx is visible on the outside as the bobbing of the Adam's apple. Sometimes food gets past the epiglottis and goes down the wrong pipe triggering a coughing reflex that is usually enough to force the food up and out. As we have seen, 
The epiglottis is an extended part of the larynx. The larynx itself is a box of cartilage that forms the passageway from the pharynx into the windpipe. Stretched across the inside is a pair of ligaments called vocal cords. Muscles are attached to these cords and the adjoining cartilage. When we relax the muscles, air passes freely through the larynx. When we contract the muscles, the cords tighten and, if we breathe at the same time, the cords vibrate, creating a sound. By controlling and changing the muscular tension on the cords, we can produce a wide variety of sounds that the tongue and lips can then shape into speech. Below the larynx is the windpipe, or trachea. From here on in, it'll be clear sailing. You may notice that down here in the mucous membrane, the cilia are beating in the opposite direction. They have been ever since we entered the larynx. Dust particles trapped here must be moved upwards to reach the pharynx. The trachea is kept wide open by reinforcing C-shaped rings of cartilage. At the bottom, the trachea divides into two tubes, the right and left bronchi, as our molecule enters the lung. The bronchi branch again and again, forming a tree of air passages within each lung. From the smallest bronchi branch the bronchioles, the thinnest airways. The bronchioles branch out and end in grape-like clusters of microscopic air sacs called the alveoli. In this final branching, we pass the last of the mucous membrane. Entering an alveolus, our oxygen molecule has finally met up with the respiratory membrane. It is formed by the thin wall of the alveolus. Creeping across the interior wall, we see a strange creature. It represents the body's last defense against airborne dirt. It isn't easy for a dust particle to make it this far without being caught by the mucous membrane. When it does, it's this fellow's job to get rid of it. It's called a macrophage, and it's one of the body's specialized white blood cells. This one lives in the alveoli, where it creeps from air sac to air sac, engulfing dust, soot, and bacteria. Throughout our journey, the heat and humidity have been rising. This is the body's way of preparing the air for its entry into the alveolus. It must be especially humid here to keep the respiratory membrane moist. The walls of the alveolus are coated with a film of moisture. As you may have guessed, the conditions here are perfect for diffusion. There are about 750 million alveoli packed into our two lungs. Seen in microscopic cross-section, these tiny air sacs give the lung tissue a spongy appearance. The larger spaces are cross-sectioned bronchial tubes and blood vessels. If we were to represent the total surface area of the respiratory membrane, all the walls of all the alveoli, on a flat surface, we would cover an area of about 100 square yards. This is more than enough space to diffuse the oxygen and carbon dioxide needed to fuel the 100 million million cells of the human body. The transport system between the respiratory membrane and the body's cells is the blood, just as it is in the earthworm and the fish. Interwoven with the tree of the bronchial tubes in our lungs is the circulatory system, which forms a continuous pathway of blood vessels to every corner of the body. All these pathways come together at the heart, the central pump through which all blood flows. This is a red blood cell, and it has an appointment to keep. The true workhorse of the bloodstream, this red blood cell is specifically designed to carry more oxygen faster than any mere fluid. There are 25 million million red blood cells. They make up nearly all of the solid portion of the blood. The fluid portion is called the plasma. Let's imagine that this is the only red blood cell and that we are going to follow along as it travels through a typical circuit. We'll start here, on the right side of the heart. Our journey begins with a heartbeat. The first destination is a lung. Here the pathway branches again and again, leading the blood through the smallest of the blood vessels, the capillaries. A web of capillaries surrounds each alveolus. Inside an alveolus, our oxygen molecule dissolves into the film of moisture and diffuses across the thin respiratory membrane, entering a capillary just as the red blood cell sweeps past the same alveolus. 
our oxygen molecule, as well as many others, latches onto the red blood cell, turning it a brighter red. The oxygen-rich cell then flows back to the left side of the heart, completing the first loop of its circuit. The heart drives the blood out again, this time to supply the oxygen needs of the rest of the body. The course it takes is determined almost completely by chance. Once again, the blood is directed into thin capillaries. Surrounding the capillaries, the living cells are all using up oxygen and building up concentrations of carbon dioxide. When the red blood cell reaches cells which contain less oxygen than the blood, its cargo of O2 diffuses into the cells. At the same time, waste carbon dioxide will diffuse into the bloodstream from concentrations outside and be picked up by the blood cell and the plasma. It now flows back to the right side of the heart, completing the second loop of its circuit and returning to its starting position. From here, it begins again, back to a lung, back into the capillary surrounding an alveolus, where it releases its load of carbon dioxide and picks up a new load of oxygen. A carbon dioxide molecule diffuses into an alveolus from an outside capillary. Let's follow it on its way out of the respiratory system. It goes out the same way the oxygen came in. As we exhale, air is forced out, up through the bronchial tubes, up the bronchi, out of the lung, into the trachea, up the trachea, through the larynx, between vocal cords, past the epiglottis, up the pharynx, into the nasal cavity, past the nose hairs, and out. In. Out. Oxygen in. Carbon dioxide out. We breathe about 16 times a minute, over 20,000 times a day. Because our breathing is controlled by our autonomic nervous system, we don't have to think about it. Asleep or awake, nervous impulses are automatically sent from the brain to the respiratory muscles in our chest. Special sensors here and here are vital to the pace of our breathing. They detect carbon dioxide levels. If there's too much, they relay this information to the brain and the rate of breathing will increase to reduce the level of carbon dioxide. During our daily activities, we are automatically switching from rapid breathing to slow breathing, matching our body's oxygen requirements. However, we can consciously override the autonomic breathing system. We can hold our breath whenever we want to. Of course, we can't hold it forever. Our bodies can't tolerate oxygen starvation for very long. Most people can hold their breath for about one minute, though there are some who can go for over four minutes. Sometimes our autonomic nervous system will malfunction. Hiccups are a common problem. They occur because an incorrect nervous signal is being sent to our diaphragm muscles, causing them to spasm and contract at the wrong time. Over the years, many people have come up with folk cures for hiccups. Most of these involve a sudden shock. But generally, hiccups go away by themselves in a few minutes. The cough is another autonomic function, so it too can be consciously controlled. Clearing the throat is a controlled, less violent cough. It is also used as a social device. We often clear our throats just to get someone's attention. For example, before we begin a speech, the cough involves the lower portion of our respiratory tract. Its purpose is to force obstructions, irritants, and globs of mucus up and out of the lungs and lower airways. It most commonly occurs when we breathe in polluted air. Smoking is a great way to induce coughing. The same problems occur in our upper respiratory tract, specifically the nasal cavity. When this area gets clogged or irritated, we sneeze. A runny nose and sniffling are other problems caused by an infected or irritated nasal cavity. Here's another respiratory function that you might be experiencing right now. When you're sitting still, especially if you're tired or <clears throat> bored, your breathing is very shallow. Not much gas is going in and out of your lungs. In this condition, the carbon dioxide level in your lungs will slowly begin to rise. The carbon dioxide sensors pick up the increased level. If it gets high enough, they send the message through to the brain to correct the situation. 
It isn't necessary to speed up your breathing rate because all that's needed to flush the excess carbon dioxide out of your lungs is one very <sighs> deep breath. This is the function of the yawn. There is another type of yawn, and scientists have yet to figure out its function. It's the social <sighs> yawn. When one person yawns, others who see it also <sighs> yawn. Nobody knows why they do this. <sighs> As we have already seen, we have far more surface area in our respiratory membranes than is needed for our simple daily activities. This is how much we need just standing still. We utilize more of it during strenuous exercise, but it's most useful when our bodies are combating respiratory disease. In diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and emphysema, it is the actual respiratory membrane, the walls of the alveoli, that are destroyed. And yet, even if we lose half of our lungs, we can bounce back and lead a relatively normal, if somewhat more sedentary, life. Our mucous membranes do a fairly good job disposing of airborne pollutants and disease-causing bacteria, with our macrophages forming an effective backup system. But the best way to reduce the odds of catching a cold or pneumonia, or of inhaling poisonous pollutants, is simply to use common sense. In cold weather, dress warmly and avoid breathing in pollution whenever possible. One thing our mucous membranes and macrophages aren't capable of handling is the volume of heavily polluted air inhaled by a smoker. Because the smoke bypasses the nasal cavity, the burden of catching all the particles rests entirely on the mucous membrane from the throat on down, which then becomes irritated and inflamed. As this pollution reaches the alveoli, the macrophages multiply in an attempt to handle the workload. But as long as the smoker continues, it's a losing battle. Eventually, the mucous membranes begin to break down. The ciliated cells start to die and are replaced by smooth cells. Without the beating cilia to give it direction, the particle-laden mucus accumulates into globs. Gravity pulls these globs deeper into the lungs, clogging and restricting airflow, triggering smoker's cough, a smoke-induced bronchitis which attempts to drive the mucus globs up and out of the airways. With continued smoking, the mucus begins plugging up the smallest airways, the bronchioles. Air that has been drawn in cannot go out. Alveoli are cut off and the lungs cannot fully exhale. This is emphysema. As a result of this condition, the alveolar walls begin to break down. The respiratory membrane is being permanently destroyed. As the patient loses the ability to exhale, the amount of air that can be inhaled decreases and the breaths become shorter and more rapid. In the final stages, the patient must wear an oxygen mask. There is so little usable respiratory membrane remaining that it must be assisted by artificially enriching the oxygen intake. The destroyed respiratory membrane couldn't be restored now even if the patient stopped smoking. In this advanced stage, the emphysema patient is so weakened and susceptible to other diseases that a mild cold could be fatal. The earlier one gives up smoking, the better. When smoking stops, the destruction stops and the repair begins. The macrophages are no longer overwhelmed by the workload. Smoker's cough goes away. Years of heavy smoking require years of repair. Even then, the respiratory system will never be as good as it would have been if it had never been subjected to smoke in the first place. That's why it's best never to start. Our respiratory system is the gateway between our living cells and the oxygen that surrounds us. If we damage it in any way, we are limiting our ability to interact with and be a part of the world in which we live. <laughs>